Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for coming. My name is Tom Durig. I'm the pharmaceutical R&D director for Ashland. And uh, this afternoon, I'd like to present uh, our, our discussion on role of excipients in solid uh, amorphous dispersions, uh, in the design of solid amorphous dispersions for drug delivery of poorly soluble drugs. Um, first, uh, I'd like to discuss a little bit the topic of why solid dispersions, why amorphous solid dispersions is important. Uh, then some of the uh, design considerations for solid dispersions. Um, take a look at some of the current uh, manufacturing technologies currently available and commercially useful. And then uh, close with two case studies on rational solid dispersion design. Uh, one for um, solubilization of poorly water-soluble drugs, the other one for uh, controlled release of a poorly soluble uh, drug. So first off, uh, just some general comments about low solubility and uh, uh, amorphous dispersions. Um, so the, bringing a new molecule uh, to commercialization today is, has become a lot more challenging uh, for various reasons. And one of the main ones in terms of oral drug delivery is the uh, large increase in the number of poorly soluble and poorly bioavailable uh, compounds uh, that we have to deal with. And uh, there's a number of approaches that have been developed uh, to help with this problem. Uh, among them are particle size reduction, things like uh, nano milling, and you see some examples on the screen like EMIND and Repimune as commercial examples. Amorphous solid dispersions being also one technology that is uh, increasingly being used. Uh, one can also formulate co-crystals where you form a co-crystal between a drug and uh, another uh, ingredient. Um, and then, of course, lipid-based uh, systems, emulsions, nano-emulsions um, would be another solution to these poorly soluble, uh, oil-soluble compounds. Um, and cyclodextrins or other kinds of complexes where we form a complex between drug and an, ac and, and a, uh, an excipient or polymeric carrier is another option. Cyclodextrins being a very notable uh, category there. And then, of course, one can also look at modifying solubility uh, with approaches such as uh, salt selection as well as uh, selecting specific crystal forms, polymorphism. Um, but amongst all of these uh, types of approaches, uh, our topic today will mainly focus on the amorphous solid dispersions, um, which are clearly an area of burgeoning and growing uh, interest and in commercialization in the pharmaceutical industry for uh, this kind of problem. Uh, an amorphous dispersion in, in its simplest might be described as a dispersion at the molecular level or solution at the molecular level of a active ingredient, an API, in uh, some sort of a uh, carrier base. Uh, quite often, the carrier in which it is molecularly dispersed would be a water-soluble polymer. Uh, some of the specific reasons why uh, amorphous dispersions tend to increase solubility is because in an amorphous dispersion, the API will be in a metastable state, an energetically higher state than it would be if it was in crystal form. But um, when one looks at uh, solid amorphous dispersions, um, there's an additional reason why these are often selected uh, over other approaches to enhance uh, bioavailability, and it has to do also with uh, permeability, because we have to remember that when you uh, apply a certain solubilization technology to increase bioavailability orally, uh, it's not just that the API has to dissolve in the um, uh, gastrointestinal fluids, but it actually has to be bioavailable after that and actually permeate uh, across the gastrointestinal mucosa in order to be active. Um, and in this area is where amorphous dispersions uh, often enjoy some significant advantages over some other technologies such as, say, surfactants, co-solvents, and cyclodextrins. Um, so, for instance, if you include a surfactant in a formulation, it will very readily enhance the solubility of the API in the aqueous medium of the gastrointestinal tract, but the 
surfactant would continue to be, uh, have a high affinity for the API and vice versa. So they would tend to be, uh, remain associated, uh, which will compete with uh, partitioning into the gastrointestinal mucosa. The same might be true for uh, such things as uh, emulsions and, and uh, cyclodextrin complex type systems. On the other hand, once an amorphous dispersion is dissolved in the gastrointestinal tract, there's really not much further uh, interaction that would uh, limit partitioning of the API into the uh, mucosal membranes. Um, so how do solid dispersions uh, really solubilize drugs? How does it really work? And we like to think here in terms of the spring and parachute concept. So at its simplest, uh, what you see on, on the screen here, uh, uh, the blue dots would represent a molecularly dispersed drug, uh, dispersed in a polymeric, uh, suitable polymeric carrier. And uh, if this dispersion is then um, swallowed and ingested, uh, you should expect that in, in the uh, stomach, it would start to interact with the fluids and dissolve. And the particular benefit we get is that, first of all, because it's an amorphous dispersion in this uh, non-crystalline, higher, uh, energetically higher state, this metastable state, we have a, a, a massive boost in solubilization. So this is the spring part over here. So typically, if it was just the crystalline API, uh, you know, in a tablet formulation, the solubility you might get is this lower line here, this dotted red line. That would be the inherent uh, solubility of the drug in the gastrointestinal fluid. But because it's in the amorphous state, uh, you get this very sharp rise here. So this represents the spring. And now at this point, your many falls higher in concentration than the intrinsic solubility. So this would be regarded as a supersaturated state. And uh, the problem with uh, supersaturated solutions is that they also are unstable, and the drug would naturally tend to want to uh, form little crystals uh, in, in, at this high level here in terms of, uh, you know, concentration and uh, start precipitating. So the risk is always if you do induce this highly uh, such supersaturated state, much higher solubility, that you might get very rapid recrystallization sort of like a sharp little peak, so that you really didn't get much benefit. So the other benefit and the other purpose of doing an amorphous dispersion, if it's done well, is that you might be able to induce what's called this parachute effect. So instead of a rapid precipitization here, a rapid crystallization, what you'll have is a more gradual decrease in uh, concentration over time, so that we actually have a nice long uh, absorption window that might last up to two hours. So typically, a well-designed amorphous dispersion would ensure that you're somewhere ab at about 80% of the maximum concentration that you were able to achieve for up to two hours. And in so doing, we can really uh, ensure uh, improved uh, bioavailability. Um, so when it comes to uh, additional design considerations for these kinds of uh, amorphous systems and formulations, uh, there's really three categories we have to think about. There's design considerations related to the API and its properties. Uh, there's design considerations related to the type of polymer we're going to choose, which polymer to select. And there's design considerations related to the actual process, the manufacturing process that we would use. So in terms of API properties, there's really, again, three buckets, and you can see them here on, on the screen. Uh, primarily, there's biopharmaceutical considerations. This would relate to the dose. How large a dose do we uh, have to deliver? Uh, permeability, as we just spoke, in terms of permeating across gastrointestinal mucosa, as well as absorption windows, because perhaps this uh, uh, drug is only absorbed in a limited part of the gastrointestinal tract because of some kind of active transport mechanism, for example. Uh, in terms of physical chemical properties, um, they, they really uh, are important from the point of view of um, stability, processability, and being able to interact with the polymer. So we're, we're always interested in, in indicators of uh, crystallization behavior. So the melting point, the TM here, that's the melting temperature, the glass transition temperature, crystallization temperature or recrystallization temperature. These are all important parameters to give us an idea about how stable would this amorphous dispersion be. Um, also, to some extent, uh, you'll see the same terms over here in processability. They help, help you guide you in terms of if you were going to do hot melt extrusion. 
also very important are things like PKA and hydrogen bonding capacity. This would guide you really in terms of what kinds of polymers you might select in order to have a good interaction. Uh, in terms of polymer selection, uh, really two main things to focus on. One is uh, what would be the best polymer in terms of assuring uh, desirable interactions with the API because the polymer very much has to be playing a role of stabilizer, uh, solubilizer, and then also preventing that precipitation once the drug is dissolved in that supersaturated state. Um, so dispersion uh, forces uh, and hydrogen bonding often are some key parameters to look at. Um, also, uh, in terms of processability, we want to be thinking about glass transition temperature, especially if you were going to try to do hot melt extrusion. And of course, uh, some of these same uh, properties would also affect uh, uh, polymer solubility, which if you were going to do spray drying is, is very critical because you'll need a, a suitable solvent in the end that can dissolve both the uh, API as well as the polymer. Uh, some of the uh, common polymers used, typical polymeric carriers for solid dispersions, um, would be the uh, non-ionic or non-enteric polymers, such as copovidone, povidone, uh, hypromellose, as well as uh, hydroxypropyl cellulose. And then really the other big category that tends to be uh, finding a lot of use would be the uh, ionic or enteric polymers. Uh, among which hypromellose acetate succinate might be the most commonly used one, and then hypromellose phthalate, cellulose acetate phthalate, and also polymethacrylates. So the second category are all uh, ionizable uh, type of polymers, generally ones that don't dissolve too well uh, in, in, in an acidic uh, medium. Um, the ones which are the most commonly used uh, I've highlighted in, in red. When we think about uh, you know, what kind of uh, manufacturing processes and technologies would we want to bring to bear, commercially, currently, there's really two processes that are most viable. There are many other ways in which you could conceive of making an amorphous dispersion, and there are one or two methods that uh, are also used commercially, but by far the two most common ones would be uh, hot melt extrusion uh, and then also spray drying. And uh, it, it's quite interesting in terms of seeing the evolution of these two technologies because you would have said that uh, until perhaps this year, the majority of marketed compounds that were in the amorphous dispersion uh, state would have been produced by spray drying or some kind of solution precipitation type of process. And hot melt extrusion, we really had one very big current common uh, example, that, that being Calitra, Ritonavir, Lopinavir uh, combinations by hot melt extrusion. But even in the last six months, there's actually been quite a lot uh, of change. And just recently, uh, Merck and company, among others, uh, have gained approval for two new hot melt extruded uh, formulations. So the balance between spray drying and hot melt extrusion, I think, is, is rapidly changing uh, to one where there are several more commercially uh, f uh, commercial examples of hot melt extrusion uh, now. Um, they both have their advantages and limitations. Just very quickly, let me hit some of the highlights. Uh, so generally, one would uh, envisage and you know, obviously conceive that uh, hot melt extrusion could be a little bit more cost efficient. You're not using uh, special solvents that require all kinds of uh, precautions. Um, you, you basically, it's all done in one step. Uh, it's also a continuous process. Uh, the equipment tends to be somewhat simpler. However, some of the limitations are that it's, it's clearly not suitable for all APIs because by you know, definition, hot melt extrusion will mean that the uh, API needs to be able to withstand some kind of heat treatment. For thermal labile compounds, this can be a challenge. Um, and in some very challenging cases where there may be a, a really strong tendency to recrystallize also in the solid state, you may not be able to succeed with hot melt extrusion because uh, inherently, although there's a lot of research being done on this aspect of uh, hot melt extrusion technology, inherently the mixing efficiency in a hot melt extruder tends to be less than it is when you have a drug and a polymer completely dissolved in a, in a um, mutually acceptable solvent and both things are in the, in, in the true solution state. So you don't quite get the same internet mixing um, as you do in spray drying. Um, 
so for spray drying, that's really one of the major advantages. If you truly want a perfectly mixed, uh, intimate interaction between the polymer and drug, uh, spray drying is, is the state of the art currently. Um, it too is a continuous process or can be run as a continuous process, one would say. And then of course, um, the other big advantage is because you're not worried about uh, will the polymer uh, you know, be thermoplastic enough for extrusion, you tend to have more choices of polymeric carriers in spray drying, whereas those tend to be a bit more limited in hot melt extrusion. Um, but some major issues and, and costs uh, are there, and, you know, these tend to be the limitations. Uh, obviously, uh, the use of uh, organic solvents can, especially on an uh, industrial scale, can be um, more complex and, and would tend to add uh, costs in terms of um, both the kind of equipment one runs and, and the process, uh, ongoing process verification. Um, so they're really complementary technologies. Uh, we tend to see them as not, it's going to be the one or the other, but uh, with these two technologies, it's possible to address the majority of uh, formulation challenges one has in amorphous dispersions. Um, so in terms of case studies, uh, the first case study I'd like to talk about is designing a solid dispersion uh, using HPMCIS uh, for a very strong crystallizer. So the, the drug involved here is azetamib. Uh, this was chosen as, a, first of all, obviously a very um, low soluble drug, but one which has the characteristic of being a strong crystal former. So this is a drug where you have both challenges in um, uh, ma maintaining the amorphous state uh, in, the, in, the, in the dosage form, so the solid tablet uh, uh, dosage form and preventing it from uh, recrystallizing before it is given to the patient, as well as then once it's actually dissolved in the gastrointestinal tract, um, and you have that, uh, if you remember the spring effect, when you have that high uh, saturated so solution, uh, azetamib tends to recrystallize or precipitate very rapidly. So to extend that parachute tends to be a little bit of a challenge. Uh, we chose here a drug load of 60%, again, because that's a much higher challenge than low doses, and to really discriminate the, the effects of the different kinds of HPMCAS uh, that are available. Um, the, the process used was spray drying, so we made uh, spray dry dispersions here with the uh, Aquazolf HPMCAS grades L, M, and H. Uh, these were all used at, uh, uh, in the, the, the spray dried solution was at a 5% uh, concentration. And then uh, the uh, spray dried uh, dispersions were evaluated afterwards for kinetic solubility as well as uh, stability. Uh, the, some of the properties of the drug are shown there in the table. So, first of all, in terms of stability in the solid state, um, we tend to run these at accelerated conditions um, for, for different lengths of time. So, one of the standard tests is um, crystallinity or ability to withstand um, recrystallization in, in an open uh, environment uh, for 65 hours at 40 degrees centigrade, 75% relative humidity. And here you can see DSC thermograms for the three formulations that were tested. So the blue one is the uh, one which contains the HPMCAS L grade. And you can see here after 65 hours under these uh, accelerated conditions, there's a little melting peak here that uh, corresponds to the uh, melting temperature uh, of, of the API, of azetamib. So there has been some recrystallization. Uh, for the M grade, the red line here, you can see that we have two glass transition temperatures indicating uh, phase separation. And you can kind of nicely see uh, that this here corresponds well, the 67 corresponds well with the glass transition temperature of uh, pure azetamib, and the 120 degrees is approximately the glass transition temperature for HPMCAS. Um, on the other hand, our, our grade H, the um, green line here, so the formulation where we use the H grade shows that after uh, that, the, you know, the time has elapsed, we still have the same um, amorphous dispersion. There's just one um, glass transition temperature roughly uh, at the point um, of the azetamib. Um, so no phase separation. So while there's no recrystallization, this here, this red line also tends to indicate 
a less stable state because once you have phase separation, usually in some subsequent time period thereafter, you should expect recrystallization. Um, so in terms of stabilization effects, we clearly saw that the H grade here tended to be more effective than the M and, and, and L grades. Um, and we think uh, hydrophobic interaction is playing a role here. These different grades have different acetyl substitutions. Uh, the acetyl uh, moiety on the HPMCS, HPMCAS tends to be the one uh, which affects uh, hydrophobicity the most. Um, and H has a, a higher level. Um, if we looked at the dissolution behavior, we again see some uh, interesting discriminating behavior between these. Uh, on the uh, red line here, that would be the HPMCAS H grade and the green would be the M grade. You kind of get some form of a parachute as you can see. Uh, we're, we're extending a relatively higher uh, concentration for maybe uh, an hour or two. On the other hand, the L grade, which is the blue line here, you see a very sharp peak, so much more effective in terms of a quick high boost in terms of a spring but very rapid recrystallization, indicating that there's really hardly any interaction between drug and polymer in that solution state, and it just pretty much all uh, uh, precipitated rapidly. Um, again, we think this has to do with the, uh, both the polymer dissolution rate, but also um, the, uh, the hydrophobic interaction with the acetyl groups being more uh, at, at a higher level in the M and H grades. Um, I think I've set most of everything on the slide, so let's move on to the next uh, case study. The next case study is, a, is an interesting one in that we're trying to do two things at once. We are at the same time uh, trying to address a challenging low soluble drug, so increase solubility, but at the same time control the dissolution rate over a period of up to uh, eight to 10 or 12 hours. So um, the challenge here is not only do we want to solubilize, but we want to maintain whatever drug is dissolved uh, without uh, re-precipitation uh, for, for a long time. Uh, the drug chosen here is nifedipine. You see the properties uh, to the, the right. And then um, the approach chosen here was extrusion. So we're actually trying to make an extruded pellet uh, by combining copovidone as well as HPMC. So two different polymers. Copovidone was chosen because it's well known as an excellent uh, extrusion polymer, very thermoplastic, good extrusion aid, also used in amorphous dispersions. And then secondly, HPMCAS is known for its excellent ability to maintain that parachute to prevent the recrystallization in solution, but also it's an excellent controlled release polymer. So the theory was if we use appropriate ratios of these two, we might uh, be able to achieve both objectives. Um, so the concept here is a bit different from the uh, hang glider effect, uh, from the, uh, uh, the spring and parachute effect. Here we have the uh, hang glider effect. So we are both uh, solubilizing and continuing to maintain a dissolution rate over a long period without, uh, you know, at, at some point having some rapid precipitation. Because you could think that it, as, the, as soon as the drug releases, it might precipitate. So in fact, you wouldn't get this nice uh, dissolution curve here, but something much lower. Because while the drug dissolves, it might also re-precipitate. And again, uh, the blue line at the bottom would be the natural solubility of the API. So here you see some of the formulation and process factors we used. We varied the uh, concentration of the API between uh, 10 and 50% and the HPMC uh, was varied between uh, zero and 40%, and then the copovidone, uh, again, used at different ratios. We also tried some trials with a small amount of polyethylene uh, glycol as, as a uh, uh, plasticizer here, just in case we had problems with extrusion. And we tried different pellet uh, sizes, two, three, and five millimeter length. Uh, we used a Lystritz um, 18 millimeter extruder, and here you see a, a typical temperature profile for our machine. Um, when we looked at the different uh, levels of drug loading, we very quickly realized it wasn't going to be feasible at, say, 50% drug load. Uh, as you can see, again, there's a very uh, strong uh, melting peak here showing that the uh, formulation had recrystallized. On the other hand, at 20 and 25% drug, um, there was really no sign of recrystallization. The uh, formulation remained in the amorphous state. 
Um, when we looked at uh, the effect on dissolution profiles and varying uh, different uh, grades of HPMC, we saw some very nice results. As you can see here in a formulation with 20% drug, 40% uh, HPMC, and 40% copovidone, and then varying the different kinds of HPMC from K4M to K200M, so roughly 400,000 to 1.2 million deltons. Uh, we get uh, a very predictable release. We can pretty much select or program the rate simply by changing the molecular weight of the uh, HPMC. And as you can also tell, there really wasn't a great amount of uh, crystallization or re-precipitation out of solution. Uh, we were able to sustain this for a good 8 to 10 hours in some of these examples. It's really only when you reach the close to the peak uh, release uh, did we see, uh, you know, a gradual decrease. So we were clearly able to achieve both a spring, a parachute, and a hang glider effect. We were also able to control release with uh, pellets uh, by just modifying the size of the pellets. So you see here uh, release profiles for three different sizes of pellets, three different surface area to volume ratios. So very direct correlation. Um, and lastly, in terms of dissolution stability, these formulations did remain stable. Uh, for up to uh, six months at accelerated conditions. So uh, really no uh, a change in terms of uh, stability. Uh, with that, I think um, we'd like to conclude. Uh, thank you very much for your attention.